Ayela, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, brother. I'm excited to be here. I'm really, really pumped for this. So I want to make sure that I'm saying your last name correctly. Is it Ayala, Ayala? Ayala. Ayala. And what's the background of the name? So it was Spanish originally. My my dad is from Mexico, but, um, you know, as many Spanish names, there's a lot of Filipinos, there's a lot of uh, Mexicans and a lot of Spaniards. So Okay, so it's basically it's Spanish in origin. Correct. Your your wife is Italian backgrounds. Yeah, uh, she's probably third generation Italian. Okay, got it, got it. Lots to talk about in that. But wh- where I want to start is I want to kind of take you back to the eighties. Do you remember a town called Elko, Nevada? Does that ring a bell to you? I I told her you remember a town. All uh, right, Elko. Nevada. All right, so Elko, Nevada. So you and I were raised in completely different parts of the world. I grew up in New York um, and you grew up in Nevada, very, very different places. But I believe that we had a similar, um, I I hesitate to use the word upbringing, um, but um, we had a similar background. Let's start there. Can you sort of describe a little bit what family life was like for you back then? Because I really think that that dictates drive that we have as we, you know, get older. So maybe give me a a snapshot to what growing up was like back in, you know, Elko, maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, those formative years, uh, let's call it five to 15, somewhere in that range. Yeah, well, what's interesting, so I never even really thought about this until you posed that question that way, but Elko was kind of like a, it was kind of like a new, book, I guess, for me. Um, The reason why we moved to Elko, Nevada from Idaho was because my stepfather got a job in in Elko, Nevada. So, but I think backing up, I, um, so my stepdad is a gem. He's amazing. Um, I actually, he's my dad. Uh, Most people would not even know he's my stepdad. So, but backing up, my real father was a complete, I mean, he was just, he was lost. Alcoholic, drug addict. He was physically abusive. Um, you know, I, my, my earliest memories of my real father were, you know, basically he'd be gone for a period of time. So it was almost like as if he was working on the road or something, but the reality was he was on a bender. He would leave my mom, he would leave me. And so my memories of my real dad were really just, you know, a lot of them were him crying and apologizing to my mom. And as a little kid, like you obviously don't even really know what's going on. I pieced all that together as I got older. Um, but my mom finally left him. And this is the crazy part too. Sometimes my mom would leave. And now that I looked backwards, I mean, it was periods of time where she needed to get away from him and she would leave me there. And by the way, just a point of clarity, he did not physically abuse me. And so um, my mom was obviously comfortable leaving me there. Um, So my mom would leave. I was always like, my dad was either gone or my mom was gone. And so, but then my mom would always come, you know, marching back with my grandparents and they'd pick me up and they'd take me away. So long story short, my mom finally left him when I was probably like for the last time I was probably seven. And, um, you know, that was just kind of an interesting time. I remember staying with him and he'd be partying all night. And as a young kid, I just wanted to go to sleep. And I remember seeing prostitutes. I remember seeing, you know, pot plants in his house, all this crazy stuff. Um, during that period of time though, my mom kind of disappeared for a little bit too. She was going and regrouping and I lived with my grandparents, which that was the first stability that I actually had in my life was was living with my grandparents. And so that was probably from the age of six to, you know, probably nine was really when I had the first stability and lived with grandparents. And then long story short, to answer the question around Elko, my mom started dating my stepdad. And for the first, you know, probably year, I didn't live with them. I lived with my grandparents. Um, My brother, who is also um, from my mom's first marriage, he was just a little, he was a baby when they separated. And so um, he lived with them and then they ended up having my sister. And to make a long story short, I ended up finally moving in with them. And about a year, maybe two years after I moved in with them, we moved to Elko, Nevada. So, so you know, it's interesting because when I, I think back on that time in my life, I, how old are you now? I'm 43. All right. So I'm 55. And I spent most of my 40s really fucking pissed at my father. He was an alcoholic. I was, I was physically abused. And... There came a point in my life where um, I needed to resolve that anger 
because if I wasn't, it was just, it was just going to kill me. And I remember he came to the end of his life. Uh, he died a few years ago and we had a healing, you know, like maybe two or three years before he died and I had to free it. But now looking back on that time, I, I think about, I don't know that I would have had the drive that I have now for the normalcy of a healthy and happy family. I don't know that I would have the entrepreneurial drive because he was a truck driver. So everything that I saw, while there's no excuse for the abuse, everything that I saw during that time in my life has served me. And it's taken me almost to 50 years old to figure that out. So I'm wondering if you feel any of that, because I know a lot of people listening right now are still blaming their parents for their shitty life, you know? Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, I love, I love the way that you said that because I, you know, I've done a lot of deep work over the last few years and I'm still working with a coach. His name's Dr. John Ryan, amazing human. And I, I'm thinking about um, when, when Karen and I first got married, which we've been married for 22, almost 23 years. Uh, I'll never forget. She was, she was 19. I was 20. And I remember having a conversation with her um, we dated in high school. So she knew quite a bit about my background. Um, and I'll never forget when we were getting married, she was like, I feel like, or about to get married. She said, I feel like you should go find your dad. I feel like you should bring some closure to this. So you don't bring it into the marriage, which mm -hmm. was like, I mean, a brilliant thing for a 19 year old to say, but also it's like the cliche thing that, you know, automatically, if you've been through issues that you're automatically damaged. And I think there's a couple of really amazing things that you're really digging on here. Number one, um, doing this deep work with Dr. John. Um, I went through a process then when Kara said that, and I really came to the conclusion that, you know what, I don't need to find my dad. I'm okay. I'm okay. I hope he's okay. I'm not opposed to talking to him. And I think everything would be fine. If he needs to have some closure, great, let's have it. Um, but that was kind of my thinking going into that. And then working with Dr. John recently, it all came up again. I'm like, doctor, I want you to really dig on this. I want to make sure that like, I'm good. And we've went through this whole you know, he's, he's, um, he's got a lot of backgrounds, PhDs, and, but he does a lot of deep work too. And, you know, through that process, I'm okay. But I'm actually at a point now, Rob, where I actually do want to find my father. And I might've even told you this jokingly, but, but it's really kind of half jokingly. It's kind of true. I want to find my dad because I want to get my Mexican citizenship, mm -hmm. but I'm also at a point where, you know, I'm, I'm completely good talking to my dad, finding my dad, but I don't need to see my dad to bring closure to me. And so the real question, and I think this is brilliant, I think we can learn as much from negative influences and negative situations and the things that we don't want in life as we can from the positive ones. And so I have a lot of mentors that I want to mirror. And I have a lot of mentors that I absolutely don't want to mirror. Um, and I think that's what my dad taught me. I want to be the father who's present. And my kids are now 21, 19, and 17. And I can honestly say that even through growing businesses, I love work hard, play hard. You know, we've got a mutual friend, um, Kyle Depp, yes, uh, work-life rhythm. Is that coming through? Sorry. No, you're perfect. Okay. Um, so the work-life rhythm, uh, all of that, that's been my thing from the beginning is, you know, watching my dad not be there. I just wanted to be the best dad in the world. I wanted to be present. You know, I, I didn't want to be abusive. I, not, I mean, not even just physically, but even emotionally. So I learned so much from growing up in that scenario that, um, became a positive influence on who I am today. And I think people just don't realize that. And, you know, you made the point that so many people are blaming their parents for their situation in life. And we got to flip that story. Yeah, we have to, we have to, you know, con contrast, I heard contrast creates clarity. So when you have this contrast in your life, it gives you the clarity to go, I, I don't, I don't want this. Like I, this is like, I had an abusive father. I am not going to hit my kid. I had an alcoholic dad, I am not going to become an alcoholic. You know what I mean? So that contrast, but you know, a friend of mine, um, who you're going to meet, um, uh, because you're, you're in, uh, my masterminds, um, his name's Darren. And he said to me, he he's one of these guys, you're going to love him. Um, he's one of these guys who says very little, but when he opens his mouth, everybody listens. Cause he's really, really, really smart. Um, and he said to me, and he always asks rhetorical questions. He's never looking for an answer, but I know what he's doing. He said, um, don't you think there's a stat? I wrote it down because I wanted to get it right. He said, don't you think there's a statute of limitations on childhood trauma? Mm. And I went, oh, 
Okay. Let me think about that. He's I'm, I, I get it. If you want to be pissed, I understand that. But when does that end? Should there be a yep. statute of limitations on that? And I went, that's good. That's yeah. really good. And that was really helpful for me to, you know, to move on with the healing. Um, okay. So I want to move um, up in age a little bit. I'm going to take you to around 22 when you uh, completed the Associated Builders and Contractors. It was a, a four-year project, project management program. Coming out of the background that we just discussed and moving into this stage of your life, what were you hoping beyond the surface of the degree? What were you hoping that that degree was going to do for your life? It's such an interesting question. And, and to look backwards, um, there, there's a gap in there. Um, so I did end up going off the deep end. I mean, when I was in high school, um, ended up, you know, I mean, I started drinking when I was in ninth, actually eighth grade, um, drinking. And then we started smoking pot and I ended up doing meth through school, ended up in jail. Kara and I were separated for this little period of time, which I don't want to dwell on that, but coming out of that whole situation, I was a functional drug addict. Um, but coming out of that whole situation and sitting in jail, I realized that this isn't the life I wanted. And, you know, I started working for this company when I was 15 during the summers, it was a plumbing and HVAC company. And as I started getting close to graduating, the guy that owned that company would, you know, constant, he kept coming at me and he's like, Hey, come to work for us. And I always said, you know, I don't want to be a plumber. I don't want to be an HVAC guy. Um, so, but when I got out of jail and, you know, I was trying to get my life back on track, I was working, I went back to the restaurant industry. I started working at an early age. If I needed something or wanted something, I had to earn it. So I started working at the restaurant at early age. And then when I went to jail, when I got out, I decided to go back to the restaurant industry. I had a mentor there and he gave me a chance and went back and got that all straightened out. Well, then I progressed and I started working with a buddy of mine at a, uh, this, um, a hydraulic hose shop. And I, I, this is really the answer to your question. I started thinking like, what do I really want? Um, and I knew I didn't want to like work at a, uh, like a hose shop for the rest of my life. But I called that guy up. His name was Doug Snyder. And I said, Hey, is that apprenticeship still available? But I wasn't really thinking through like my future and I want to be a plumber. Or I want to be an HVAC guy. Um, he said, yeah, absolutely. You can start Monday. And I called Kara and I'll never forget this. And she actually talks about this a lot. I called Kara and I said, Hey, I'm going to take this job, but just so you know, um, I'm starting next week and I'm going to be working out of town. And she actually tried to convince me not, not to take that job because we were young and we were dating and we were in love. And um, that was kind of one of those pivotal things. And so I think the question is, you know, when, when I graduated from associated and builder, uh, associated builders and contractors, that was like actually four years later. Um, but I wasn't really thinking about, you know, what I wanted my life to look like. And I know that sounds crazy. And I think most people are walking through life that way. I didn't really have this outcome where I said, you know what, I'm going to finish this program and I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be a business owner and eventually own real. I, I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was purely thinking about how do I make money? I'm a young guy that's getting married to Kara. We had a kid a year later. I was purely thinking like, I think most people do. How do I create the best path for you know income and provide a life for my kids? But what got interesting, and I'll wrap it up with this, working that, I was probably the youngest, I was the youngest foreman that that company had ever had. And I was running this three and a half million dollar casino remodel at the age of 23. But then at the age of 24, Kara was pregnant with our third child and I was working out of town. I was literally working between 90 and 110 hours a week, managing that project, doing paperwork. And I would, I would leave the job site at seven, eight o'clock at night on a Sunday. And I would drive home. I would have a cold dinner. I would wash my clothes and I'd go back and do it all again at three o'clock the next morning. And I woke up realizing that, you know, the plan that Kara, Kara and I always said that we wanted to make memories over possessions, which again is why I just love what you're doing. But then we quickly realized like you can have all of it. But the thing that I didn't sign up for was missing my two young boys growing up and missing, you know, Kara's entire pregnancy. So I quit and started a business. All right. Um, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things I want to dig into here. Um, you glossed over them. Most people don't say I was addicted to meth. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I did a little stint in prison and, you know, then I was the king of England. Um, mo most people don't skip over that stuff. And I'm not going to, we're not going to spend hours on it, but I, but I have to dig into a few pieces of this. Um, <clears throat> can you walk me through, just so I understand, that first moment where you took a hit of meth, what was going on in your life 
that that seems like the logical next step. Because there, there might be somebody listening right now that is in that place. How do we, how do we help them? Like, where, where were you at that moment? This is, this is crazy. Um, so I worked at Denny's. Mm-hmm. Um, I started working at Denny's when I was 15. And the manager that I said I went to work for after I got out of jail and was a mentor of mine, he was my manager at Denny's, but then he went off and started another company. And the manager that took over at Denny's was a drug addict. Um, and, you know, Karen, and I have had this conversation a lot because every time as a, as a teenager that I had a, like a really negative pathway, there was an adult on the other side of that influencing that, which is an interesting, you know, thought process. So anyway, I'm working at Denny's. Um, I always worked really hard. Like I said before, if I wanted something, I had to earn it. So I would go to school all day. And, you know, like I said, I was a functioning drug addict, alcoholic, even in high school, um, smoking pot, alcohol, but I'd go to, I was going to school and it was finals time. So I was going to school and I was working from two o'clock to 10 o'clock at Denny's. And then I was going home and studying for finals. And I came in one day and I was so tired. And at this point in time, I had gone from a busser to being a line cook. And there was a guy, there was a guy that I cooked with. His name was Kyle. And he was probably 45 years old at that point in time. He was a functioning adult drug addict. And I, I came in one day and I was so tired. And he's like, Mike, you look, man, you look bad, man. And I'm like, well, I'm working. I'm, you know, studying for school. And he's like, here, try this. And he hands me a little piece of paper with some folded up meth in it. Um, and I, went home and tried it and didn't sleep that night. And then went on a, that that's kind of where it started. Oh my God. I cannot believe, you know, when I think of somebody doing meth, I, I, I think of a crack house and there's somebody with tattoos and greasy hair and they've got a, you know, a a rubber thing around their arm or, you know what I mean? These pictures that you see, but I don't think of an adult that is, casually handing somebody who's tired, uh, you know, meth to do. So, um, okay. And, you know, the rest of that story, I think a lot of people can fill in the gaps. It'll make a lot of sense. But now you find yourself that there's a moment where you're in jail. How long were you in jail for? Um, It lasts, it was about a month. Oh, okay. So it wasn't like years. All right. So it was like about a month. Was... When was the moment when you were on the other side of meth and jail where you hit thresholds and you said, I'm done? Not another minute, not another second, not another moment. It changes and it changes now. When was that moment? It was a, it was a progression that started before I went to jail. Um, it was kind of interesting looking backwards. I mean, I think sometimes the universe has your back. And, and uh, so before I went to jail, I found myself at a spot where, you know, I, I had lost my job. I wasn't able to pay my rent in my apartment. And by the way, I'm 17 at this point in time, almost 18, because I graduated early and all this stuff. Um, I started looking around and I started realizing that this wasn't the life I wanted. When I lost my apartment, I was homeless for a little bit, like couch surfing, sleeping in my truck, which my parents wouldn't give me all this stuff. And I started looking around and I started realizing like, this is not the life that I want, but I kind of didn't know how to get out of it. And that's the thing that, you know, I've really, I've employed a lot of people, um, you know, even against sometimes, you know, other people's best advice and everything else, because I've often said this, you can't help someone until they actually need it, but when they actually want, or until they actually want it, but when they actually want it, they need a community of people around them. And that's really the thing when I was done, um, I, I ended up getting arrested. I went back and actually one, one Friday, I had gotten in contact with all my old friends from high school. I said, Hey, let's just go out and drink. Like drinking was kind of like the, the, um, the, the way out of this. And I ended up getting arrested that night. Um, the, all the narcotics division came and arrested me. And it was just this weird scenario. If that had happened a week before that, I probably would have been in prison. Um, but they arrested me with a beer bottle in my hand and a piece, some paraphernalia in my pocket. And that's what landed me in jail for just enough time to make me realize I was already thinking like, this isn't the life I want. And while I was in jail, and I think this is important, um, my parents were done with me. They had a restraining order on me for right reasons. I mean, I would, I'd broke into their house, all kinds of stuff. But when I was sitting in jail, Kara, who, you know, her and I had split up for a while for again, obvious reasons. She wrote me a letter in jail, just telling me about, you know, God and, and her, her parents had basically said that 
when I got out, if I needed help, um, they were there to help me. And I'm just like, what is this? Like what? So I'm sitting here in jail. She sent me a Bible. I'm just like thinking about, you know, all the good people in the world. And um, long story short, when I got out of jail, I was just like, this is not, I didn't want to continue that trend. And so I started going to church and, you know, Karen, and I slowly over time started dating again. And on the other side of that, there was like a purpose. I, um, you know, it's not enough to want to get clean or to want to change your life. On the other side of it was a group of people, a community that surrounded me and helped me get through it. So I did relapse. I, I relapsed once. Relapsed once. <clears throat> and are you completely sober now? Or um, would that be the wrong word to describe you? <laughs> I think that's probably the wrong word to Yeah, I'm not sober. Okay. Um, I yeah, so I haven't done drugs for, you know, I mean, meth is not even something that sometimes Kara's like, I don't know if you were actually an addict. And I don't, you know, I, I don't, I'm not really here to get into the chemical side of it. But if you put a line of meth in front of me, that would not be an issue. I have too many great things going in life. Do I have alcohol? I mean, I drink alcohol. I love wine. Yeah. That's something that I jealous watching your life. Um, so, you know, I'm not an alcoholic. Um, I do stints where, you know, Karen and I will not drink alcohol for three or four months. Just right. To, but it's like, not like you go into AA meetings all week long. Okay. No, Got it. Definitely so. Got it. Okay. So, so now let's move past this background. Let's move into sort of the world that you're in now. You've made a decision to invest in mobile home parks. Is that the right term, mobile home? Yep. Okay. Is yep. there a difference between mobile home and trailer park just for the, um, yeah, you know, I think the only real common misnomer, um, we call them manufactured home communities. Now these are, these are not RVs. They're not technically mobile. You know, they're, um, in the sense that if, if people think of a trailer park and you think of like manufactured homes that don't move, then yes, that's, that's what we're, that's what we're investing in. Okay. When, why let's start with why. Why did you choose to invest in mobile home parks um, outside of a business decision? In other words, was there a piece of you that felt like I was kind of a kid that was in this place? And is there a king of the mountain thing for you? Like I'm coming back and I'm going to own this bitch. Or was there a, a piece of you that was like, I'm, I'm, um, uh, they need my help? Like what, what was the emotional component there? You know, there, it, it was, it was an investment of opportunity, um, which we can dig into a little bit. Um, but having since, um, gone through that, there, there is a part of me. So, you know, I lived, I lived in a, a manufactured home community, a mobile home park in a 1976, one bedroom, one bath with five of us growing up. It's some of my you know best memories. And so, I think what has made me a good operator is understanding the humans that live there and they're just people trying to do what everybody else is trying to do. And so I think that's made me a good operator, but no, it's not a King of the mountain scenario. It was purely um, I'll make this quick, but when Karen and I started our first business, I was at a business planning event with a consulting company and they basically the whole first day was around. And, and one of the guys who ended up becoming my coach said, if your business isn't helping you achieve your personal goals, you just own a job. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. And so he said, basically the whole first day was around designing what your life wanted to look like and making sure that your business is always helping you achieve that and not that your business is running your life. So Karen and I set a goal of buying two income producing properties a year for 10 years. I came back from that event in the first year we bought two single family homes. And in my mind at that point in time, Rob, I was probably 25. In my mind, I thought if I bought 20 single family rentals, by the time I'm 65, I could retire off of them. So I bought two the first year. And then the second year, this mobile home park deal falls in my lap. I was scared to buy this thing. It was 72 spaces, um, basically 72 tenants, right? And my big grandiose goal was to have 20 tenants. So I went to a mentor of mine and long story short, I said, hey, I've got this deal. He said, you're lucky that you're my friend because I would take this deal, go buy this thing. The person that was selling it, she had a first position note on it for 390. She wanted 480,000. Um, so she basically wanted $90,000 cash. I didn't have the cash. My mentor lent me the cash. So I got this mobile home park deal with no money down. And I quickly realized, so I was good at plumbing. I was good at construction. I was good at HVAC. Those are all the things that these um, communities need. So I was, it was like a great fit, you know, um, construction wise. And um, it just made sense as an investment for us. So that was your first one. And you were how old at that time? 
I was probably 26 when I bought that first one. Okay. How do you navigate 71 tenants at 26 years old? You can't even like, you're still trying to figure out how to keep your, your apartment clean. Do you know what I mean? Like how, how are you navigating and all of the never ending problems that come up? I can't pay the rent. The toilet is broken, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is easy to say now, but as a young entrepreneur slash investor, um, you know, I was, I used to call it stack and bodies, which sounds horrible now to me, but, um, I, I was growing so fast, by the way, our business was on the Inc fastest growing companies in America in 2009. So at every step I was just Rob, I was like, how do I find someone to help me do this or that? And, um, you know, I've just been fortunate that I, I think I'm a better person you know, people person and organizing the troops. Uh, I'm a visionary at my core. And what I realized at an early age is that you need people to do that. And so even at the mobile home park community, it came with this older lady that lived there. Her name was Frenchie. Um, and I still talk to Frenchie today. You can't, um, you can't make this up. You, you get, yeah. it's, it's kind of like the strip club. There's, o- there's always, there's always the, the lady in the back, you know, uh, they call her honey. You know, she gets the girls, the outfits, right? So Frenchie. Okay. I'm with you. Go ahead. Yeah. So she, she kind of came with the park and she was like a, a, you know, an honorary manager. And so she kind of helped us, you know, get everything taken care of. But at that point in time, I had a really good assistant um, who kind of helped me manage my portfolio too. I had an assistant at the plumbing and HVAC company. And by the way, fast forward to today, she owns her own business. She owns an accounting and a property management firm, and she still manages all my personal properties up in Nevada. So um, that's how I got into that first deal. And, and your question was, how do you keep all, it's yeah. just people. Um, I'm, I'm moving so fast. It's all about stacking, stacking bodies, but I do it in a more intelligent way now. Than when I, you say stacking bodies, are you referring to, um, people to manage is that, are, are the bodies, the employees who are managing the moving parts? Yeah. I'm just always looking for a who. And again, I say this different now, but back yeah, then I guess it's like, um, you know, I'm always looking for a who I love. I coached with Dan Sullivan for a while. And when he said who, not how it revolutionized. It, I'm like, yes, that's what I've always thought. And he put it into words and into a book. So at everything, I was just with Lori and Chris Harder last week and, and we were talking about this. I mean, everything we need is on the other side of a person. Um, mm. It's never, ever, ever about how it's always about who. I love that. Um, so you, you're a big fan of coaching and masterminds and um, getting together with groups and stuff. And you just came off of a I think a year long couples um, event with Chris and Lori um, Harder. What did you sort of like learn from that experience? I think you guys went uh, three locations around the country um, with some, you know, super high level, we'll put the word high level in quotes, um, people. um, And they were all couples. What was that experience like for you? Chris and Lori did such an amazing job of assembling um, humans that, you know, we, we may not, we may not have connected otherwise. And, and, you know, a a lot of times when you get together with a group like that, that's curated, um, we're not from different, completely different backgrounds. And we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't meet and be like, Hey, let's go to dinner. And so that was probably one of the biggest things that I've learned along the way is um, some of my greatest relationships are not people or couples that I would have chosen to hang out with. And so it's really taught me that, you know, our comfort zone or the people that we feel comfortable hanging out with are probably not the people that are going to, you know, bring me to my highest level. And that's probably the biggest thing that I learned this year. Cause mm. I mean, they put together a group of couples that was just phenomenal. Every yeah. single one of them. Yeah. Great, great people. I, I know a lot of the people in that group. Um, in fact, I've introduced them to Chris and Lori. Um, there, yeah. there, a lot of them are, are, uh, fantastic people. You're doing uh, coaching yourself now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I do a little bit. Okay. Um, is that something that you want to do more of, or is that something that you just sort of like do on the side? So it's probably something I'm going to stop doing. Um, Cause I had this huge revelation this year. So I, I said, I would not take more than five one-on-one clients. Okay. And I didn't. And, but I'm, I was sitting here a while back. And so this goes back to the who, not how. Um, and this is just a personal revelation I've had. It's not right or wrong, but I was looking at my clients and how much their businesses are growing and their success rate and um, everything else. And I had this epiphany one day, if I put the same amount of time and energy into like, I've got a guy, Tyler, who's the CEO at Park Place Communities, our manufactured home communities. 
Um, if I put the same amount of time and energy into coaching Tyler and being a mentor to Tyler that I do when somebody is paying me to show up, it wouldn't make me $45,000 of trading my time a couple times a month. It wouldn't make me $45,000. It would make me yeah. 450,000 or maybe four and a half million or so yeah. I'm going all in on, you know, just partnering with partners and, and that kind of stuff. And the, you know, whether it's the private equity space or from the operating side, I'm a really good operator, but I want to move away from operating as, as much as I used to, and, uh, you know, start teaming up with more operators. So I think you're going to see me doing less coaching. I think that was the, the point. It's, 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 it's an interesting coaching is an interesting thing, isn't it? It's you have so much to offer and you help people, but it's, it's one-on-one, -on -one. however you do it, it's one-on-one -on -one and it's one hour away from, you know, the bigger mission that you're, you know, you're working towards. You're at, you're at that up, that, that upswing now where you're building. Um, I'm assuming that you're working towards an exit. Is that right? Well, um, I think an exit is always a potential possibility, but um, even within that, I'm working on building a community where, um, and, and this would probably be through some masterminds and I'm, I'm working with a guy who does love coaching where we can vet operators and we can marry, a, you know, private equity with operators and ultimately get them what they need while mentoring them and then getting them the capital they need. And ultimately at the end of the day, I mean, I've always been a buy and hold guy. I never thought about selling any one of my properties, but even that first mobile home park, I sold it um, two years ago at, you know, four times what I paid for it. Mm -hmm. um, so everything's for sale, but that's not always my, I'm not one of those guys that's always like, I'm buying this to, with an exit in mind. So you're in a place now, you know, we started at the beginning of the show to talk about, you know, the, the dark moments, right? Um, but you're in a place now where the sun is shining and you are, um, you're in record growth, you're exploding. Um, there's probably nothing um, that, you know, I mean, I'm sure you want to have, you know, 10 jets, but there's probably nothing that you really want that you kind of can't buy right now. What is the thing that's in the back of your head now that you're like, you know, my life is good. I have, I have money. I have my wife, my kids, everybody's healthy, but I'm kind of at this place now where, you know, if I can wave the magic wands and do something else, move somewhere different, start a different, like what's that thing right now that's percolating that you haven't really talked about, but it's in there. So it's kind of in the same thread, but I'm working on something. Um, it's called Velocity Venture Partners. And what I want to do at Velocity Venture Partners is form a small team of partners that I, I think of it in terms of like the Knights of the Round Table. Um, I want a small group of partners that have um, different skill sets where we complement each other. One of them might be, you know, somebody who's really good at um, analyzing acquisitions. One of them might be like a CFO. One of them might be an operations guy. I want to formulate, I want to build a small team of like, if it was a Marvel movie, it would be a small team of guys and girls that are really good at analyzing, vetting deals and placing capital with operators. And so to me, um, and I feel like if I go really niche and small with the right group of um, partners, then that's really the freedom that I'm searching for. Everything in my mind is always about, you know, keeping my time freedom. And it doesn't mean that I, I'm in a season of, I'm really grinding right now, but it's by choice. And I just want to be, I want to make sure that I always have the choice to, um, you know, work as much as I want or not want. And the only way that I can really see of accomplishing what I want to accomplish and be able to keep that freedom is through assembling the Knights of the Round Table at Velocity Venture Partners. So are you more interested at this stage of your life from a business standpoint, are you more interested in producing monthly income or are you more interested in, in flipping things to get bigger checks? Um, I'm more interested in uh, flipping things to get bigger checks. I'm more interested in building wealth. In fact, one of my, if I had a, a BHAG would be to have a $25 million family fund where, you know, the kids eventually fly. There's this whole conversation around, you know, wealthy people that are not going to leave them, their kids, anything versus, you know, um, other people that are like, Hey, I just don't want them to be spoiled. And so I have this dream, Karen, I have this dream of having a $25 million family fund. Yeah. That's just our families and the kids fly in once a quarter. And if they want to participate in learning how to analyze deals, how to meet with operators, et cetera, then 
that's how they earn their inheritance. Oh, so they earn their inheritance. They have to figure out what to do with that money. So you're yep. making them in, instead of instead of saying like you're not getting anything. Um, I'm going to put my last nickel in the slot machine. You're saying, okay, well, let let, let me teach you how to make money. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. All right. So I'm going to uh, shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk um, personally, but but not not in like dark times and fun times. I want to ask you some weird uh, questions. So just roll with it. Yep. What's on your nightstand? A gun, a gun <laughs> safe, melatonin, a lamp, and um, that's it. What does that say about a man that's got melatonin next to his gun? I love that. <laughs> what do people, I, by the way, that's the first one. I've asked that 400 times. That's the first time I've heard that. What do people uh, often get wrong about you personally? Um, there's, there's a lot of people that don't get to see, you know, how my, my calm side, my compassionate side. Um, you know, when I'm in the, when I'm in work mode, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I can be pretty forward and aggressive yeah. and, you know, not everybody gets to see the, the soft, compassionate. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty easy going after hours. Are you, are you a, a bull are you, uh, are you just super aggressive type A or like, how would you describe yourself when you're in business mode? You know, this is, this is a weakness of mine. Um, when we're just stacking bodies and we're not putting the right people in the right places, I can be very aggressive. I can be frustrating. I can be frustrated. That's something that I've learned over time is when you hire the best, I'm actually not a bull. I'm not aggressive. I'm not, it's, it's when it's when I'm, it's when I'm putting people and this is all on me. It's when I'm putting people in the wrong positions and I'm expecting more of them and for them than they can actually handle or see for themselves. That's where I get frustrated. So it's really more about me than, in, in but some, yes, I'm a, I'm a fool. In some ways you're more frust frustrated with yourself. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's interesting. Um, what are some things that you're doing that you don't love and you would love to do less of these things at this point in your life. I'm in another really um, big season of, of growth and I'm, I'm putting people in positions that again, um, I, I have to do this, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a high level visionary. And when I have to get into the weeds um, and I'm in a lot of weeds right now, um, we're, we're revamping our entire mobile home park fund. And so you know, financials and pro formas and negotiations and legal. I just, I hate being in the weeds and I'm in the weeds. So um, that's part of the round table. If I could get a CFO eventually and somebody who has high level legal, exp I've got great attorneys, but they're also, you know, $500 an hour. So if I could assemble the right team over the next couple of years, that's going to eliminate a lot of that. This is an interesting conversation. Um, you know, I was uh, working on a, a separate deal um, this week and I was doing the Zoom and it was the first time I ever did a Zoom with a, uh, a CFO. And holy shit, I mean, like this woman was eviscerating the other person on the other side of this Zoom that I was on. And they are so skilled um, at the area of finances and law and technical things that it's very interesting because the person I was on the call with had, he's got a C-suite, right? And he's got a CFO, he's paying 375,000, a, a COO that's 400,000. And collectively, they're just beasts that, and I'm watching him who really is the owner of everything. He's not saying a word. He mm -hmm. is just watching these fucking animals <laughs> that are just <laughs> moving shit and changing yeah. things. And, and, and he's just literally, he's texting while well, I'm on the zoom, he's texting me and he's like, she's a cannon, huh? And like it, I realized that, you know, we had this conversation offline, he and I, and we're talking about solopreneurs versus true operators like CEOs. Mm -hmm. so we are so, as solopreneurs, 
we are so used to running and gunning things on our own mm -hmm. that that is not how these guys build their companies. They are mm -hmm. building, you know, you're calling it stack and bodies, but they're, you know, they're building it. So they've got this infrastructure that is just making this shit happen. And they're yeah. calm because mm -hmm. they built that, that fortress. So um, I thought that was interesting. What new behavior or habits has most improved your life recently? There's, I don't know if you're familiar with Keith Cunningham, but he's got this principle called thinking time. And, you know, when I first started meditating, um, I love meditating. Um, whenever I feel that I'm out of balance, like I can literally just go sit down for five minutes and meditate and I'm, I'm, I'm new. Um, yeah. When I first started meditating, my brain would start solving like some really complex problems. And I'd be like, Oh no, we're meditating. We can't. Um, then I heard Keith Cunningham talk about thinking time and he's got a thinking chair, a thinking pen and a thinking notebook. And that's his version. But by the way, Keith's a, a, a multi-billionaire and very successful. That's what he's always done. And it's his form of meditation. And so I've built a hybrid of meditation to where I can go deep and, you know, silence and everything else. But if, if my brain conscious subconscious starts solving big problems, um, I go into thinking time, writing time. Um, so I, I would just pose that. I mean, meditation is great, but being able to also know that when your subconscious higher self goes into problem solving, um, I love thinking time and I love having that thinking pen and that thinking notebook. Are you data dumping everything that's in your head or are you posing uh, with a prompt at the top of the page, I need to solve X. How do I do it? Is it like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's these, you know, all of us have these problems that we're constantly coming up against. And so you, I just, just like I have a, a list of guests that I want on my podcast or, you know, um, ideas of videos that I want to record. I keep a, a list of thinking idea time. And you just go out, how long you how long do you think for, are there any particular parameters that you have around it? Is it 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or just until the problem is solved? I'm a very unstructured person. So I think, you know, if, as long as I'm planning on sitting down for five minutes, if it goes for 20, great. Keith always said it was, it was a scheduled 45 minutes for him. Hmm. Really interesting. I just started doing uh, transcendental meditation. It's, it's a, it's a game changer. What's an unusual or absurd thing that you love? So, you know, you'd be like, well, people think this is weird and maybe it's a little absurd, but I, but I love it. That's a good one. Um, man, that's a really good one. I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. It's absurd. Um, <laughs> or, really or, or unusual, like this is unusual. Like for example, I'll give you a little thinking time here. I love house music. I love DJing. I've got a whole DJ set up. I listen to house music. I like listening to electro house acid and people be like, really? Like that's yet. Yeah, I love that. That's something that I absolutely love. So is there anything that comes to mind for you that, that people would think is weird, but you actually like it? I, there's nothing coming to mind that I just, we got to get you some, is, we, we got to get you some weird shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. What's one goal that when you thought you achieved it, like the whole, like the whole, my whole world is going to be amazing. Like when I get this thing, everything is going to be perfect. And then you okay. got it and you went, that did nothing for me. I sold my first business at the age of 34 after 10 years in, and I was basically retired. I still, I still make multiple six figures a year from that exit. And it just, uh, that night I went to dinner with my, um, my wife's sister and her husband and a couple friends. And one of them said, yep, Mike's done. He exited today. And the, the guy was like, congratulations. And I was like, I, I just didn't feel it. And I've often said it was the best and worst day of my life. I have heard that story a thousand times. I can't tell you how many people, uh, I just did a call with somebody who exited this morning for 250 million. And actually he exited two weeks ago for 250 million. And he's trying, he's banging around now trying to figure out what the hell to do. And it's a very interesting dilemma. 
when you're not driving towards some particular goal. I mean, who do you know who's retired, who is, um, you find is offering you any value? <laughs> do, you know, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like a lot of them, they're just, they're doing crossword puzzles. I mean, yeah. not everyone, but you get the idea. There's not a whole yeah. lot of contribution that they're, they're putting into the world. If you could spend a month anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Anywhere in the world. Um, it's funny because we have a list of places we want to spend. Um, but when it's said, when you're say anywhere in the world, I think Bali, I've spent a lot of time in Indonesia, but um, it's just, it's been calling to me. You know, I think I want to, I think I want to go there. It's really I'd interesting. Like I did a, uh, I did an interview with somebody um, and we had a conversation. She lived in Bali for years and she said, Bali is like um, the womb. When you get there, you feel like if you're called to it, you get there, you feel like you're in your mother's womb. It's, it's beautiful. And it, but there comes a point where the mother spits you out, <laughs> spits you out of her womb and you can't live there anymore. She said, I've seen it a thousand times. So it's this weird, I've never been, it's this weird place that draws you in and then will spit you out when it's done with you. Yeah. Well, Kara's parents um, left about two months after we got married and lived there for 12 years. Oh, so you and know. So yeah, we visited a lot when, when we were younger, but I'd like to go there and immerse for a little bit. That's interesting. Um, are they still there or do they move back? No, they've, they've been all over. They lived in Africa and um, all over the place, but now they're in Wyoming of all places. That's really interesting. That's unusual. There are, there are not many parents that you hear that do that sort of thing. That's really yeah. cool. Well, he was a gold miner. So, you know, that, ah, that took him a lot. okay. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> are there any positions or opinions in the last few years? It could be way back. doesn't have to be in the last few years that you've changed your mind substantially about where you, you know, you used to, I used to feel this way about it, but I changed my mind. I don't feel that way anymore. Yeah, there's actually quite a few that I can think of, but um, gosh, there's so many. Um, you know, the way I think parenting, I mean, our kids are 21, 19 and 17. And, you know, the way that I thought about parenting probably 10 years ago, I'm, I'm, I'm quite different now. Um, and I, I think there was a version of it that we saw all the way through, but um, as I've gotten older and I think backwards, a lot of my preconceived ideas about how I should parent versus how we actually ended up parenting. And then what I would say to others have changed quite a bit. Mm. All right. We're going to do a speed round in our last five minutes here. What would your friends say is one of your superpowers? Um, making complex things simple. I'm a pretty simple guy. People think that, you know, I'm this genius and I'm, I keep things simple. What keeps you up at night? Um, you know, the world is changing so fast. Um, I think we're kind of in this exponential um, age of change and just trying to make sure that I'm not thinking through yesterday's lens. I mean, even mm. whether it's how we analyze real estate or whether it's, you know, how we used to think about managing employees or any of that, it's how do, how do I not get stuck in the way that, and, you know, yesterday's tactics? Mm, that's really good. Um, what do people never ask you? But you wish they, you wish they would. They never ask me this question. They always ask me about real estate. They always ask me about making money. But they, I, I wish they would ask me this. Mm -hmm. How, some people ask this, but very few. How, how, do you, how do you manage and build everything you've built and not miss a game and be present for your children and um, keep family first. It's a great, it's a great question. What's the answer? People like it's, it's who, not how it's, you know, even back to keeping complex things simple. And when you're talking about, you know, your buddy and, and his C-suite, that's my nights of the round table. I, I had a mentor one time that said, if you're the smartest guy in the room, find a bigger room. I want to be the dumbest guy in the room. I actually, I got really excited internally when you were talking about him in that meeting, him being quiet. Um, I, I don't want to have to say anything. I, 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 I don't want to be needed. There's no ego in it. I, I literally want to check my ego at the door and just smile. 
Well, the good news is you're going to get to meet them. So that's uh, that's a, a cool thing, and you're gonna you're gonna love this. Um, all right, couple more questions, and then we'll uh, wrap. What is your guilty pleasure? Probably wine. Mm. Well, maybe whiskey. Actually, probably whiskey, because <laughs> me and wine are okay, but me and whiskey are you know not at a certain point. So. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm going out tonight uh, for a Negroni with a, with a couple of Italians. And um, one, of them, <laughs> one of them said something to me last week. He said, um, I want to get this right. He said, drinking Negronis are very similar to women's breasts. And I said, how's that? He said, well, one is not enough. And two is perfect. Three is too much. <laughs> <laughs> I, went, I like that. I went, that's, that's absolutely perfect. Okay, last question. I know that you're going to be interviewing me, so it's a kind of a not a fair question, but if you had to ask me, uh, what one question would you like to ask me? What's been the hardest thing of transitioning to your life in, in, in Italy? The hardest thing is my friends are very, very important to me, uh, the friends in America. And um, when I moved to Italy, and this is like, you know, my friends listen to this podcast, so I don't want to sound like poor me, but the, the texting and phone calls and time together, obviously we're an ocean apart, so that's not easy. But the texting and phone calls almost came to a complete halt. Mm. And when I, uh, I was not prepared for that because, you know, you think we're in the digital age and, you know, we, we have a, a little thing in our pocket that can connect with anybody at any moment in 17 different ways. But there is, there's a weirdness about it. Like, um, I was talking to Chris Harder about this last week. We did a Zoom together. And um, <clears throat> this guy I was talking to about that exited his company and uh, my other friend, Darren, that I was telling you about earlier that, you know, talked about the statute of limitations on, on childhood trauma. Um, the three of them got together and went to Miami. And I was like, you fuckers, you didn't even ask me. And they were like, you're in Italy. And I'm like, it's, it's an eight hour flight. Like if I, if I, like, it's not like I'm in, I'm on Jupiter. And I had a, a you know, a, a long talk with Chris about this. Not, I mean, not, not a lot. Like it wasn't like a come to Jesus, but we, it was interesting. He's like, I don't, I don't even think about, like, I think like you're, it's in my mind, you're all the way in Italy. <laughs> he said, I don't know how else to put it. I just, and yeah. so all my friends think, I'm on an, in another world and the, um, the connection um, has been um, difficult. And I, I think that in fairness, you know, even if like, you know, Chris is in, in Arizona or LA or, you know, my friend Darren is in Seattle. When I'm in America, there's, well, I'll fly to Seattle or, you know, you fly, let's go to Florida. And there was always a time where we were working on, I'll see you in June. But I have no intentions of flying back to America. I'm very happy here. This has been like a, quite literally the most magical experience of my life that I just don't want to leave. I just don't. And so there's none of that. And they know that. And I know that. And so ca continuing the relationship um, has been difficult, difficult. Mm -hmm. So I would say that was, that would be the biggest answer there. It's not what, and I did not expect that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was a weird thing. Well, listen, um, this was amazing. I have so many, um, new insights and I got a lot of notes here. Do you have any, any final words, suggestions, or an ask for the people that are listening? You know, I, I think the biggest thing, and, and this is what I love, um, you know, just watching what you're doing. Um, we just, I think sometimes we just have to be careful what, you know, 
what we really ask for and, and just be really clear. One of the things that I'm always talking about on my podcast is, you know, what do you really want and what do you want? And just making sure that we anchor with that. And so um, I would just challenge people to, you know, so many times people think that they can't do what you've done for all these reasons. Uh, but then when you really set your mind to it, you move to Italy and you're working through it. And so, I don't know, I would just challenge people to, you know, just think through all of that. And, um, you know, the only ask I would have is, if you want to check out the podcast, it's called investing for freedom with Mike Ayala. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm more just even like I was talking about, you know, getting out of jail, the community aspect of it. Um, that's what I love what you're building. And, um, if, if anybody's looking for, you know, and finding their freedom through investing, um, check it out. Love it. All right. We will link everything up in the show notes and, uh, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, sir.